Here's a computer I've had for a couple of years now, but I haven't really done anything with because instead I've been mostly using my Tandy 1000 SL, which you can see in the background there. But this is its predecessor, the Tandy 1000 SX. This was introduced in late 1986 as the first major upgrade from the original Tandy 1000 which was introduced in late 1984. The improvements compared to the original Tandy 1000 include a faster CPU running at 7.16 MHz instead of 4.77 MHz, so that's 50% faster. It has five internal expansion slots instead of only three. The standard memory on the motherboard has been upgraded from 128K in the original 1000 to 384K, upgradable to 640K on the motherboard, whereas the original Tandy 1000 was not upgradable on the motherboard. You had to use an expansion card to upgrade the RAM. Also now comes standard of direct memory access, DMA, which for example allows the floppy drive to be used while the computer is processing other tasks. The power supply has been upgraded from 54 to 67 watts, which is still very low powered by modern standards. Also now uses a DC fan instead of the AC fan of the original 1000. Also several cosmetic changes. The floppy drives are now white, or at least they would be if they haven't yellowed like this one, instead of the black floppy drives of the original Tandy 1000. Also the A drive position was flipped from the bottom drive to the top drive. Also, the power switch on the original Tandy 1000 had a very nice lighted switch which would glow red when you turned it on, while the Tandy 1000 SX just has a standard non-lighted beige switch. Unfortunately, one thing that has not been changed from the original Tandy 1000 is the keyboard. And that's unfortunate because not only does it use a non-standard layout, which is actually missing some keys, for example, the scroll lock key, even though you would think you would never use it. I do have one old DOS game which says press scroll lock to exit. Well, on this computer you can't do that because it doesn't have a scroll lock key, so you just have to reboot the computer to exit that game. And there's the infamous hold button, which if you press it, everything on the computer freezes. And because it's so close to the enter key, backspace, up arrow, you're likely to accidentally press it and then wonder why the computer is not responding. But the main downside of this keyboard design is that it uses a non-standard 8-pin connector. So it is not compatible with standard XT or AT keyboard. And this applies to all of the older Tandy 1000 systems, the original Tandy 1000, the 1000A, the 1000HD, the 1000SX, the 1000AX, and the 1000TX. The all-in-one versions of the Tandy 1000, the EX and HX, have this same keyboard design, but since it's built into the system unit, you're not gonna find one without it. Which is a problem with these. If you find one without a keyboard, the keyboard itself may end up costing you more than the computer, similar to the early Macintosh computers. So if you're gonna get one of these computers, you really should try to get one including the keyboard. But luckily I did get this one including the keyboard. It's in pretty good shape except the keys are starting to yellow. It's not really visible right now on camera, but you can kind of see these plastic trim pieces are also starting to yellow. And somebody found it very important to write down that the F12 key in whatever program they used was for saving their document. So they wrote it in permanent marker on the keyboard itself, save with an arrow pointing to the F12 key. A little bit more history about the Tandy 1000 SX. It was introduced in late 1986 at a price of $1,199 for a two drive system. In 1987, the price was quickly dropped to $999 for the two drive version, or they introduced a lower cost single drive version, which I have here, for $849 and that continued into 1988 when the single drive version was the only version you could get. The two drive version was discontinued. And then in late 1988 it was replaced with the Tandy 1000 SL which I've done several videos about. Those prices did not include a monitor. If you were really cheap or you just wanted to play games you could use an RF modulator and connect it to your TV but most people would opt for one of the optional monitors. You could get a monochrome composite monitor 
for $129.95. You can get a cheaper, higher dot pitch, more grainy color RGB monitor, the CM5, for $299.95. Or you can get the higher quality, lower dot pitch CM10 monitor for $459.95. That was later replaced with the CM11, which I have here which sold for $399.95. Also to upgrade the RAM from the standard 384K to the maximum 640K would cost you $129.95. And if you bought the single drive version and wanted to add a second five and a quarter inch floppy drive, that would cost you $169.95. Or you could get an optional three and a half inch 720K floppy drive for $199.95. On the back you can see the five expansion slots, the printer port which uses a card edge connector which was carried over from Radio Shack's TRS-80 series of computers. So if you had one of those and you were upgrading to a Tandy 1000, you didn't need to get a new printer cable. You could just unplug it from your TRS-80 and plug it right into here and it would work. There's a light pen port which is rather strange because I don't believe Tandy ever actually sold a light pen to go with these computers. At least not in their stores. Maybe you can get one from special order. And virtually no software even supported a light pen. There is a CGA monitor port and video and audio RCA outputs so you can connect it to a composite monitor or a TV and you can connect it to external speakers. This one has had some upgrades over the years. That's an internal 2400 bits per second modem which is a Radio Shack part. You can see there it's kind of shiny and hard to read. But it says Tandy 2400 BPS modem model 25-1037C. This card was introduced in 1989 at a price of $179.95. And over here may look like a parallel port card but that's actually a SCSI controller. That's because I got this computer with this very yellowed external SCSI hard drive which plugs into that card. Also interesting on this computer is this sticker on the back for Radio Shack in Belleville, New Jersey, which I'm sure no longer exists. But look at that expiration date, November 30th, 1996. So I don't know if they bought this computer for a very long extended warranty or maybe they had some repairs or upgrades done later. And that was the warranty for that. But that's unusual to see this kind of computer is still in use in 1996. Also on the front panel of the Tandy 1000SX is this very nice bright red reset button. There's the keyboard port which is very convenient to have on the front panel. Whereas the IBM PC had it on the rear. And two joystick ports which were carried over from the TRS-80 color computer series. So if you had a TRS-80 color computer you could use the same joysticks with it. Another point of making this video is to show some of the upgrades you can get for this kind of computer, such as a NEC V20 CPU, readily available on eBay from China for less than $10. You can also get an Intel 8087 math coprocessor. I don't have one right now, but I have one on order from China, and that cost me less than $10. These computers also did not originally come with a clock calendar chip, so every time you turn it on, you have to enter the time and date. But you can solve that with a smartwatch chip. It's a Dallas DS1216E, readily available on eBay for less than $20. Although so far I've had a 50-50 success rate with these things. I bought one to put in my Tandy 1000 SL and it works perfectly. Then I bought this one originally to put in my Zenith Easy PC and it does not work. So I just bought another one. I'll see if it works or not. If it does not, I can just file a claim and get my money back. Otherwise, there is a guy making new equivalents of this, which also uses the standard coin cell battery. So when the battery in those goes dead, you can just replace it. It's not built into the chip like this thing. I think they cost around $35, but he's designing it for the Tandy 1000 EX, which is the all-in-one system. So I don't know if they'll fit in the 1000 SX. I'll have to send him a photo of the 1000 SX motherboard and ask him if he can make a version that'll fit this system. But more importantly is this XTCF card based on the XTIDE card which was designed to allow the use of modern ATA hard drives in an old XT system like this. The CF version instead has a compact flash card slot. Now the nicer ones have a slot that can be accessed 
from the back panel so you don't need to open up the computer to change the card. This is the cheaper version, the Eco Lite version, in which the slot is internal. But the nice thing is this comes with the card. It's a two gigabyte card and at least according to the eBay auction it includes bootable software so it should come with MS-DOS and some utility software which I'll have to check out and it costs just under $50 on eBay. But since I'm old school I'm also going to be installing a three and a half inch floppy drive. Now luckily I found this kit at a thrift store for $3.99 that did not include the drive. I installed one of the ones I already had but it did include the mounting frame, this cable adapter, and the power cord adapter. But I'll probably also need to switch out the floppy drive cable because the original one that comes with the Tandy 1000 SX is not long enough to reach a three and a half inch floppy drive. But luckily unlike the Tandy 1000 SL I should be able to use a standard floppy drive cable because unlike this system the 1000 SX does not send its power through the floppy drive cable so I don't need to worry about that. I should be able to use a standard cable. Before I could show you this system in operation I had to do some troubleshooting because it's been a couple years since I last used this computer and when I first started using it again it would turn on and boot up DOS just fine but many of the programs I tried to run would just lock up. The system would just stop responding and the only thing I could do was push the reset button. And after a lot of troubleshooting of different components, the problem turned out to be dirty contacts on the RAM chips. The RAM chips themselves are fine, just they had dirty contacts. I had to remove them and clean the contacts and reinstall the chips and now it works fine. And I can see why that's likely to happen because this is the air intake for the system. That's where the air that the fan blows through the system gets sucked in through and that's directly in front of the RAM chips and there was actually a buildup of dust here so all that dust and debris flowing across those RAM chips is likely to get into the contacts and that's where those problems can develop so if you have one of these older Tandy 1000s and it's locking up a lot when you're trying to run programs and you don't know what's causing it try cleaning out all the dust here removing the RAM chips cleaning the sockets and then reinstalling it and hopefully that will fix it. The motherboard is dated June 1988 so that's when this computer is from. You can see the first bank of RAM chips is the Samsung chips 150 nanosecond. Then the second bank, bank 1, you can see are different kind of chips Texas Instruments chips rated at 100 nanoseconds and their date code is from 1991 so it looks like this computer was bought originally in 1988 and then in 1991 or thereabouts it was upgraded from the original 384k to the full 640k by the way if your 1000 sx does not contain the full 640k on the motherboard the 41256 ram chips it takes are still readily available. You can find them on eBay for less than a dollar each so that will be a very cheap upgrade if you need to expand your 1000SX to the full 640K of RAM. And while I have it open I can show you here's the CPU. I've already installed the NEC V20 chip in place of the original 8088. Here's the socket for the optional math coprocessor, the 8087 chip. And when you install that chip, you have to remove this jumper in order for the system to detect it. Here's the ROM chip under which I will install that smartwatch real-time clock module once it arrives from China. And here's one thing you may not know about the Tandy 1000 SX. This is a volume control for the internal speaker, which can get quite loud. So probably Tandy got some complaints especially from schools that the speaker was too loud so they added this volume control and if you turn it all the way down it actually mutes the audio coming out of the speaker so that's the volume control for the internal speaker and nearby is this jumper marked E1 and E2 if you have the full 640k of RAM on the motherboard make sure that jumper is not installed otherwise if you only have 384k installed there should be a jumper there also right next to the CPU are four dip switches from left to right they're numbered one through four normally they should be all set to on which is 
with the switch towards the back of the computer. The first switch controls the internal video. If you want to disable the internal video, such as to use a EGA or VGA card, you turn that switch off. The second switch controls the IRQ that the internal video uses. Normally you don't need to change that. Just leave it on. The third switch controls the floppy drive controller. If you want to disable the onboard floppy controller, you turn the third switch off. And the fourth switch is for the parallel port. If you want to disable the onboard parallel port, you turn the fourth switch off. Here's the original floppy drive cable that came with the computer. And you can see it's far too short to be used with anything other than the original TIAC five and a quarter inch drives that originally came with the computer. And another odd thing is that this stripe that you would think would be marking pin 1 is actually marking pin 34. Pin 1 is on this side. So you just have to keep that in mind. And you would think you would be able to replace it with any standard PC floppy drive cable with the twist between the A and B drive connectors, but you can't. Because in another carryover from the TRS-80 series, Tandy does not use the twist in the cable to determine which drive is A and which drive is B. When IBM came up with that system, it was actually a modification from the industry standard Shugart floppy drive interface that had been around since the 1970s. So you could think of that twist in the cable as a proprietary standard that IBM invented and which most other computer manufacturers ended up copying, but not Tandy. They stuck with the original Shugart interface which used a straight through cable. So instead of the twist in the cable, Tandy used the drive select jumpers to determine which drive is A and which drive is B. This is the original TIAC five and a quarter inch drive that came with the 1000 SX and it has those jumpers right here right next to the interface cable connector. Right now it's set to D0 which indicates this drive is set to drive letter A. With the jumper on D1, the computer would now recognize this as the B drive. That's fine with five and a quarter inch drives because most of them do have those drive select jumpers, but unfortunately a lot of three and a half inch floppy drives, especially newer ones, don't have those jumpers anymore and they're hardwired to drive select one, which in the Tandy's case would be drive B. But I got lucky with this one. It's an older TX drive. Model FD235HF5291U and this one actually does have drive select jumpers and you can see I actually already changed it to drive select 0 originally came with it set to drive select 1 so you can easily change this to whichever drive letter you want just by changing this jumper but the problem like I mentioned this original cable it came with is not going to reach this drive it's too short and there's not enough space between the A and B drive connectors. So I ended up taking a standard PC floppy drive cable and modifying it. This is something I learned from Adrian Black's video where he installed a 3.5 inch drive in his Tandy 1000 EX. He took another PC standard floppy drive cable and he untwisted the twist. What you do is you pop off the clip that retains the cable to the connector here on the end and you can carefully pull off the part of the cable that was twisted, untwist it, and then put it back. You have to offset it a little bit so you can get a fresh connection with the little pins that cut through it. So you can see that's what I did here. You can also actually twist certain wires of this cable if you have a drive that's stuck on drive select 1 and you want to change it to be drive select 0 so you can use it as the A drive. There's actually a way to configure this cable by twisting only certain wires and if you want to do that I suggest you watch Adrian Black's video about that. But in this case, since I do have the drive select jumpers on both drives, I could keep it straight through on all of the pins. And now I can use this floppy drive cable to connect both of the drives. And thankfully this mounting frame kit came with the necessary adapters for both the power and the disk drive connector. That converts it from this pin type connector to a card edge connector, which this cable will use. And you just have to keep in mind, this drive, pin one is in the middle, and with a card edge connector, pin one is the side that has the notch in it. So in that case, it goes on like this. And then our interface cable, which I just modified to be straight through on all the pins, 
The stripe in this case is pin one, so I can connect it like that. And now I can use this floppy drive with the Tandy. It was rather difficult because even the power cables that Tandy provided are rather short and you may need to use an extender if you install a different type of floppy drive than what it originally came with, but luckily I was able to get them all connected and hopefully everything is all configured properly. So let's try it out. This should be the A drive, so I'll put in my boot disk and we'll see what happens. Okay, so the floppy drive seek, first the A drive, then the B drive. And now it's booting DOS from the new 3.5 inch A drive. There it goes, it's working. I know people will be recommending me to install a GoTech USB floppy drive adapter and that's something I do intend to try in the future. Just not with this computer. I want the main emphasis of this upgrade video to be this XTCF Ecolite card. Trying it out and see how it works with the Tandy 1000 SX. And by the way, this side panel is removable. When you first open the case you'll see this cross brace here which you can easily lift up. And then this thing unscrews. There's one, two, three, four screws holding it in place. You can take off the side panel to get better access to the CPU and coprocessor. And there is the XTCF card installed. I put it in the second slot to give myself enough room to access the compact flash card. And I'm going to leave out the SCSI controller because I have no use for it and it may cause a conflict with this card. So I'll, I'll leave out this card and just use this one. I also decided to put back in the original modem because it is an original Tandy part so I think it belongs in this system and it's not really bothering anything else if I leave it in. And I decided this is the perfect computer to use with this Microsoft Import Bus Mouse Card because I would like to use a mouse with this computer but it does not have a serial port built in. I could add a serial port card but I don't have any cards that are just a serial port. I just have multi-function cards that have all sorts of other things I don't need. So I might as well use this to use it with this bus mouse that I did a video about a while back. It'd be a perfect computer to use with it. So now you can see the three cards I have installed. The XTCF Compact Flash card, the bus mouse card, and the internal modem. For now I'm going to put this computer back together without the coprocessor or the smartwatch chip because those are coming from China and they're going to take a while to arrive. So I'll deal with those later. One neat thing I discovered is that the XTCF card not only has these pins for connecting a drive access LED, for example if the case you're putting in has one on the front panel, it also has an onboard drive access LED. Which is really quite neat to see. Well, I think that looks quite alright with that 3.5 inch drive now installed. And unfortunately I had to break off the plastic posts that this filler plate was attached to, but I'm sure if I wanted to reinstall this and return this computer to its original single drive configuration, I could figure out some way to reattach it. Wouldn't be too difficult. So here's the mostly finished product, temporarily borrowing the CM11 monitor my Tandy 1000 SL in the background. So I have the three and a half inch floppy drive installed, keyboard and the Microsoft bus mouse with its card installed as well as the XTCF card and the NEC V20 CPU. So here we go turning it on. There's the boot screen for the XTCF card. Gives me some options, but if I don't press anything, it'll automatically boot from the compact flash card. 
And there it is at the DOS prompt. Here's a close up of the boot up process of the Tandy 1000SX with the XTCF card installed. Now if you want to boot from a floppy disk you have to press A to boot from the floppy drive otherwise if you don't press anything after a few seconds at the menu it will automatically boot from the compact flash card as you can see there. And like I said this card came with a 2 gigabyte compact flash card pre-formatted and pre-installed in this case with MS-DOS 6.22 but one of the disadvantages of using a 2 gigabyte card in an old XT class system like this is that when you have it formatted all as a single partition it takes a long time to count up that free space. It would be even worse if you had a original 4.77 megahertz IBM PC. So in a computer like this I would recommend repartitioning it into smaller partitions that way it wouldn't take so long to count up the free space. But you can see it has DOS installed, just a pretty much a clean installation of MS-DOS 6.22 and it has some utilities in the XCCF directory. The flash utility allows you to reflash the card with a newer version of the BIOS as they become available. And then there are some other utilities here for configuring the card and the IDE configuration, which you probably won't need to mess with, especially since it's working fine. And over in the DOS directory, there's just one thing I wanted to show, is that in addition to all the standard MS-DOS files, they gave you this, the CT mouse driver, otherwise known as Cute Mouse, which is nice to have. It works fine with serial and PS2 mice and takes up very little RAM but in this case it's not too useful because it does not work with a bus mouse so I'll have to use the standard Microsoft mouse driver for that and one of the advantages of a compact flash card is not only that it's a lot easier to work with than a physical hard drive especially the 30 plus year old hard drive systems like these would have originally came with it's also a lot faster and quieter too since it doesn't make any noise. Although sometimes I like the noise of old hard drives. But in this case we're going to see how fast this card is, the 2 gigabyte card it comes with. And here are the results. Looks like pretty consistently 265 kilobytes per second. Seek time of 1.5 milliseconds and a performance index of 38.24. So you can see the data transfer rate is not really competitive with 386 and faster computers, but for an XT class system like this, the original 10 megabyte XT hard drive would have been 85 kilobits per second. And this is 265, so that's quite a bit faster. And you can also see the difference in seek time from 31 milliseconds down to 1.5 milliseconds. And that issue of it taking a long time to count up the free space when you do a directory usually only happens the first time after you boot up. Afterwards, it's pretty much instant since it keeps that in memory. And really the main advantage of this card, especially this particular version that comes with the compact flash card pre-installed with MS-DOS is you don't need anything to get your computer working. You can stick one of these cards in and you'll be up and running with MS-DOS ready to go. With no floppy disks needed, no installation, it's just right there. As soon as you plug it in, turn it on, you're ready to start using DOS programs. And then you can take out that compact flash card which is not the most convenient with this particular version of the card because it's not accessible from the rear of the system so you have to open up the case to do it but you can take out the card stick it in a card reader in a modern PC and load it up with old 
games and utilities and any kind of software you download from the internet you can copy it over to the card stick it into the old system and you'll be ready to go and unlike a 30 year old hard drive there's no need to park the heads when you're done using the computer just turn it off so that's it for now we'll have a part two of this video series on upgrading the Tandy 1000 SX once the replacement smartwatch chip arrives as well as the 8087 math core processor and I'll show you how to install those and I also replaced the 2 gigabyte card that the XTCF card came with with a 64 megabyte card that's much more appropriate for this age of computer I already recorded video about installing that and partitioning it and formatting it but this video was already long enough at half an hour long so I'll save that also for part two of this video series.